Hey Dietrich Labs, Sam here. So in this video, I'm going to show you how to work through one of the most famous quantum mechanics problems, and that is solving the Schrodinger equation for the one electron atom. Hydrogen atom appeared in the video title because it is the most famous one electron atom. But I left Z arbitrary, so you could pick whatever works for you, whatever one electron atom you're playing with. So you get the equation by inserting the Coulomb potential for the potential function, and you make sure the sign's right to make it attractive, and then you stick the uh, Laplacian and spherical coordinates into the equation, and you get the full uh, Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom, or the one electron atom, in spherical coordinates, which turns out to be a separable partial differential equation. So I separated variables. The first thing I did was I subtracted this term to the other side, multiplied by a minus sign, then multiplied by the multiplicative inverse of this factor, which gave me that equation. <clears throat> then I multiplied by r squared, which got those terms ready for separation of variables, specifically separating the radial and angular parts off. So I subtracted those two terms to the other side, postulated the separation of variables on sots that would do that for me, and since I'd set it up so nicely, all I had to do is insert it and divide by the solution, and it was automatically separated. And then I set it equal to the separation constant that was required in order to make the angular equation be solved by the standard spherical harmonics. This is a single variable ordinary differential equation for uh, the radius, I guess, saying single variable and ordinary differential equation is redundant. But anyway, this is the two-variable partial differential equation for the, representing the angular part. So then to set this up for separation of variables, I uh, multiplied it by the solution, by the minus sign, after subtracting this term to the other side. And then, uh, then I multiplied it by sine squared theta, which uh, got this term without a factor on it, a theta-dependent factor that's a problem, and I subtracted it to the other side, and now it's set up for convenient separation of variables. So I selected this on sot to do it. <clears throat> then, because I'd set it up so nicely, all I had to do was insert it and divide by the solution, and it was automatically separated. So I picked a standard m-squared separation constant, uh, and then read off the two equations. This is the polar angular part and the azimuthal angular part. So now I needed to solve the three separated ordinary differential equations. The first one's easy. Uh, it's solved by these phases. Now, because phi is an angular variable uh, and we need single-valuedness, we need this phase to have the same value for phi equals 0 and phi equals 2 pi. Now, this uh, phase is periodic because of its relation to trig functions. And given that, the way to make this single-valuedness happen is to pick m to be an integer. So then, that's all we can get from this azimuthal angular equation. Now we've got the polar angular equation to satisfy. Now, if we take x equal to cosine theta and perform the coordinate transformation, this turns into the standard form associated Legendre equation. But both in this form and in the standard form, it's extremely well known in phys er, math, well, math and physics, but it was first extremely well known and exhaustively researched in mathematics. And from all that mathematics research, it's known that the subset of solutions uh, that are non-singular are the associated Legendre polynomials of cosine theta, and we need the non-singular part so it's normalizable, as is mandated by quantum mechanics. So the associated Legendre polynomials are a subset of the uh, associated Legendre functions of the first kind. Uh, specifically, it's a subset where L equals a non-negative integer. I meant non-negative. I shouldn't have put positive because technically that excludes zero, but the lowest value this can take is zero, and M equal to integers. So that's the subset of the f first kind associated Legendre functions that are within the subset of associated Legendre polynomials. Uh, so then, as I said, the solution, the, the normalizable solutions are, the non-singular solutions are the um, uh, associated Legendre polynomials of cosine theta. Now, this equation actually has two linearly independent sets of solutions. The, um, 
the first kind associated Legendre functions of cosine theta and the second kind associated Legendre functions of cosine theta. But the uh, second kind has uh, logarithms in it that cause problems. They cause logarithmic singularities which threaten normalizability and as a result have to be thrown out entirely. Then the subset of of the first, uh, the associated Legendre functions of the first kind that work turn out to be the, um, the specifically the, Legendre, the associated Legendre polynomials. So that's what came from the mathematical research of this equation, which was well known before this problem came about. So now let's look at this, these associated Legendre polynomials a little bit more in order to get another piece of information, an interesting piece of information about the quantum numbers M and L. Okay, so these are the associated Legendre polynomials in terms of the Legendre polynomials, and these are just the Legendre polynomials. So uh, basically M controls the order of the derivative of the Legendre polynomial uh, that you have to take in order to get the associated Legendre polynomial. And then L controls the order of the unassociated Legendre polynomial you're differentiating. Now if you pick the uh, M to be too large, you'll differentiate the finite order um, unassociated Legendre polynomial uh, so many times that it'll actually give zero. And since the wave function is proportional to this uh, theta factor, uh, it will zero the whole wave function and give an invalid state. And you don't want that. So what that means is you need to make sure your M is selected to be something specific uh, that is restricted by the value of L that you've selected. And that relation is specifically this one. If you don't pick M uh, such that its absolute value is less than L, then you'll get zero because you'll be taking too high a uh, order of a derivative of the polynomial you're differentiating to get anything but zero. So that's the last thing to be learned about uh, the angular, or the, the specifically the polar angular part on its own, at least for now. So then we can put the two pieces together. We insert an A normalization factor. Then we've got a polar angular factor and then the uh, <clears throat> azimuthal angular factor, which we established when we set up for separating those variables and we worked out that they have those values there. So now all we need to do is normalize. The normalization condition is the standard orthonormalization condition, the orthogonal and uh, when you have selected the same values for the quantum numbers in this factor and that one, they give you one, so they're normalized. <clears throat> now when you actually do this integral, it doesn't quite work out, you get this unwanted piece here. But then you select the normalization factor A to cancel it, which means it has to be the square root here, and that leaves behind the part you want according to the normalization condition. Now this epsilon is either a plus one or a minus one, and it's just a convention in quantum mechanics. It doesn't actually affect the normalization because it squares away. Okay, so then we can insert this value of the, the normalization constant in here, and we get the final completely normalized solution to the angular part of the Schrodinger equation for the one electron atom as the standard orthonormal spherical harmonics, which is interesting. And now we can look at the radial equation. <clears throat> the radial equation is by far the most difficult to deal with. So the first thing we can do is we can simplify this derivative term here in this radial equation that uh, we got through separation of variables by taking this on sots. It simplifies that term to this. We insert it, divide by r, and it gives us this equation. We can multiply it by minus sign and then um, <clears throat> we can multiply it by the multiplicative inverse uh, of this factor in front of the first set of parentheses. And that gives us uh, something that looks like another Schrodinger equation, specifically like a one variable Schrodinger equation. And if you treat it like that, then this ends up functioning like a centrifugal term in the potential, which makes a lot of sense given the angular nature of the problem. Okay, <clears throat> so now we need to do a change of variables. 
Uh, and the first thing we're going to do is divide by e and then pick k squared to equal that. So then we get a 1 over k squared in the denominator, uh, technically a k squared in the denominator, 1 over k squared in the numerator there. Then we get uh, a uh, <clears throat> 1 over k squared here. And then we get an e in here and we can multiply by the additional constants required uh, to not change the value of anything when you insert a k squared into the not denominator, absorbing that e. Okay, so then we can change the variables. Uh, it's just a constant rescaling. I change the name of the function just as common practice when I do that. <clears throat> Since it's a rescaling, k squared dr squared turns into d rho squared, and then kr quantity squared turns into rho squared, and um, kr turns into rho, and then we just absorb all the rest of the constants in this rho naught. <clears throat> so the next thing we can do is we can uh, attempt to solve this equation. Now, the way we're going to do this is actually really clever. Ultimately, we're going to try and use a power series method on it, but we, it's not convenient to do that right away because it actually has asymptotic behavior that um, makes it hard to do that. So what we can do is we can look at this equation in its... Uh, uh, asymptotes, so we can look at the asymptotic behavior of it by taking rho to be really large and then really small and seeing what it simplifies down to in those limits. We can solve uh, those simpler equations and then we can create an ansatz by taking the product of the two normalizable asymptotic forms from the two limits times some unknown function. Now what that does is it basically recognizes that we know that the, the solution is going to behave in a certain way in asymptotic limits, so we just stick that in there. And because the differential equation ultimately contained that information, uh, <clears throat> that it was to behave like that in those asymptotes and uh, in those asymptotic limits, and you specifically inserted that behavior into the ansatz, there's a good chance that when you insert that ansatz, you'll get a differential equation for that unknown factor that can be solved with the power series method, and it turns out you can here. So that's the clever approach we're going to take. We're first going to take the, in this approach, we're first going to look at the limit of large rho. Now that zeroes these two factors, so we get this crazy simple differential equation, which then has that solution because only the one term was left. <clears throat> okay, so we can see that uh, only the first one is normalizable, so we throw out the, the second one by setting b equal to zero, and that's our asymptotic form for large rho. Now we can look at this equation again and talk about small rho. This term is going to dominate. It's going to grow the fastest when the rho goes to zero, so that's the only one that's left in that limit. We get this equation. Now, the convenient solutions to this, well, the, 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 the complete set of solutions uh, comprises of two linearly independent ones. Now again, this one's not normalizable because it's 1 over rho, or well, L over rho. Wait, no. I mean 1 over rho to the L. That's what I meant to say. So then it has a problem singularity that makes it non-normalizable at rho equals 0. So we set b equals 0 again, and take this as our asymptotic form. So then our ansatz becomes this here. So you see we've got the two asymptotic forms and then the unknown part. And because the differential equation already told us that it should behave asymptotically like that, uh, um, there's a good chance that some of the, in some sense, the differential equation will simplify down when we insert this in because we've already accounted for that asymptotic behavior. So you can insert it and take the second derivative, simplify as much as you can. Ultimately, you end up with this. Now that doesn't look simpler, but it actually uh, is in that it's much more suitable for solving with a power series. So that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to insert this power series in. <coughs> now um, you can see that there are our second and first derivative terms that are multiplied by a row. Now derivatives will lower the exponent, and we ultimately want to factor out uh, a, a, a factor of rho to the j to get a recurrence relation that we can use. So we want to actually have different expressions for uh, the, the rho or the derivative of 
v of rho, the first derivative, uh, with one that involves rho to the j and one that involves rho to the j minus one, so that when we multiply it by rho, everything ends up with uh, rho to the, the j power. <clears throat> now, what we then want is an expression, a power series expression of the second derivative of v of rho that involves a rho to the j minus one, so then when we multiply the rho in again, we'll end up with a rho to the j and we can factor it out. Uh, get coefficients that must be zero, and then we can derive a nice recurrence relation from that. So, if we just uh, differentiate it, immediately we get this result, which is one of the results we want for the first derivative, for when we have a factor of rho in front of it in the equation. Then we can also change it up, because uh, for j equals zero, the term will be zero. We can actually add one to it, and not change the series, and that gives us this other form we need. But then if we differentiate this, we get exactly the form of the second derivative that we need with the j to the minus one. So then if we stick that in, uh, we get this result, and if we multiply the rows through, uh, then we set it up exactly so that we can pull out a row to the j here, and get just one big gargantuan coefficient um, in front of this uh, rho to the j, and that it must equal zero, so the coefficients are zero, and that gives us this recurrence relation. Now, we might try and sum the series to infinity all the way there, so then uh, to get a solution, but it turns out that doesn't work. We can see that for large j, this is the behavior of the recurrence relation, which gives us this behavior for the coefficients, but then we can see that leads to an exponential here with a a positive exponent, and if we insert that into the ultimate radial solution, we can see that it's going to cause the solution to grow quickly, really quickly. It'll cancel that exponential, and the one over r certainly isn't uh, doesn't grow f or shrink fast enough, <clears throat> or uh, it, it, it doesn't shrink fast enough as r goes to infinity to compensate for the exponential. The exponential wins, so we end up with a non-normalizable solution. So what that means is the series has to terminate. And that's going to give us polynomial solutions, and ultimately there'll be associated Laguerre functions of all things. So anyway, what, the whole point of that analysis here, once we got the recurrence relation, was just to establish that we have to terminate the series. That is the next step. So we're going to pick some j max, the power at which it terminates, and uh, say that because it terminates, it must uh, it, it must go to zero for j max plus one. Now then, if that's zero, because of the nature of the recurrence relation, all the higher ones will also be zero. Okay, so then we have uh, the, the numerator must be zero. Now this is where the energy formula for quantized energy levels is going to come out. So this quantity in the parentheses is just some integer, so we pick it as our quantum number n. We stick that in, we get uh, 2n equals rho naught. <clears throat> so then we have that equation here, we plug in uh, the value for rho and then the value for k into that, and then we solve it and we get the famous energy formula. Now this came from imposing boundary conditions, because um, we had to terminate the uh, recurrence relation uh, terminate the sum of, of we, we couldn't take the sum to infinity because we had to terminate the recurrence relation because when we did take the sum to infinity uh, and didn't terminate we got something that was non-normalizable. Non okay so the uh, emphasis or, or the, the requirement that it be normalizable is what caused us to have to terminate the series, terminate the recurrence relation, and ultimately get this restriction that gave us quantized energy levels. So quantization came from imposing the uh, boundary conditions that were required to get normalizability to happen. So that's ultimately where it comes from. So now that we've got the energy levels, we can consider the actual wave function solutions. So this was the equation it satisfied, and this was the recurrence relation. It turns out polynomials that have this recurrence relation and that differential equation can be expressed in terms of associated Laguerre functions. And it works out because n, l, n and l are all integers. So we don't ever plug in anything into the associated uh, Laguerre 
uh, functions that, that's inconvenient because you can see in the standard expressions we end up having to differentiate um, <clears throat> with respect to or, or uh, w uh, with respect to to rho, but uh, specifically where the order of the derivative is has got to do with these um, numbers here, and it. it it's not so convenient to study associated Laguerre functions when they aren't integers because you can't just write it out conveniently like that. Now you can write out the associated Laguerre differential equation and ask what are the solutions for non-integer values of these constants and the mathematics is there you can define them but these formulas don't work because you can't have a, a fractional order derivative so the fact that all the constants turned out to be integers was really really nice and convenient because then we could get a convenient representation of the polynomials that solve this differential equation and have that recurrence relation in terms of the well-known associated Laguerre functions. <clears throat> and the specific representation works out like that. If you pick v of rho to equal the associated Laguerre functions of two rho with those uh, index values, then you will generate exactly the polynomials that this recurrence relation generates and satisfy this differential equation, specifically that are normalizable solutions to this equation. Okay, so then with that uh, established, then we can uh, go on to normalization. We've got the radial wave function. We're almost done here. So we remember that we had that uh, u of the r over r on sots, and I've inserted an, a normalization constant, which I called a, right? And then <clears throat> u of r was replaced with w of rho, and then we had those two asymptotic forms, and we got a differential equation for v of rho, and then we found the solution in terms of these uh, associated Laguerre functions, which generated the polynomials that that recurrence relation we found did. So then uh, what we need to do is we need to plug in the various constants we defined. So uh, rho equals kr, k squared equals uh, this value. And then um, <clears throat> uh, we want to uh, look at the Bohr radius because the uh, standard solution is usually written in terms of it. So we can basically we're plugging these in and we get we get all the constants that we absorbed into these definitions back in our expression and it's complicated and messy so then we absorb them into a different constant the Bohr radius that's just the standard so then rho becomes zr over n the principal quantum number times a uh, <clears throat> so then we can plug that in as the argument in here like that and uh, that's a, a big part of the job and now we're actually ready to consider uh, normalizing. <clears throat> okay, so I'm just looking here for a moment at what I wrote. Oh right, okay, so RNL equals, yeah, I'm, I'm, I've got it. Okay, I'm back to where I was. So then this is the thing we need to be integrating to work out what the normalization factor A is. The normalization con condition, again, is just the ordinary orthonormalization condition. Of course, there are some extra factors because we're in spherical coordinates, as there was in the angular case. But then, of course, uh, uh, sort of, uh, 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 well, just like the angular case, when we actually do this integral, we don't get just what we want. We get A squared times this mess. So then as in the angular case, what we can do is we can pick A to be what it needs to be in order to cancel the part we don't want and satisfy that condition. Turns out A has to be equal to this. So then uh, we have up here uh, the radial function. We plug all the constants in, get it into the standard form. This is the uh, radial function with the unknown, the radial part of the wave function, with the unknown normalization factor. We've just figured it out. So then now we can plug it in here. Uh, and when we do that, we get this immediately, but uh, it turns out we can simplify it. We can take this factor here and here, and it'll lower the power on that to just L. And then we've got 2 to the L and R to the L, so we can absorb it all in and get this beautiful solution here. So this is the normalized radial factor in the wave function. 
So then we know that the the solution is just the um, is just the product of the two. It is the product of the radial part of the wave function and the angular, which we both solved for and normalized. <coughs> so uh, then that gives us the full solution to the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom, and it is very beautiful. Now there's one part of this solution that I forgot to go over. It's somewhere in my papers, and I'm going to have to find it right now. But it explains where the constraint that L has to be, um, uh, well, it's already known to be 0 or greater, an integer 0 or greater, but it has to be less than or equal to n minus 1. So I'm going to have to find the part of my work where I... Ah, 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 oh yes, okay. So, the power series that we plugged in to get the recurrence relation, that we then terminated, uh, it's a, a, a series of positive powers. So the lowest, or well, non-negative powers. So the lowest value uh, that we could possibly terminate it at is zero. So J max has to be uh, zero or greater, an integer that's zero or greater. However, we defined n to be this. So if the minimum value of j is 0, then that means that uh, <clears throat> l has to stop at n minus 1. Otherwise, uh, j max, if you picked an l larger than that, j max would be negative, and you'd be terminating it at a negative power that actually isn't present in our series. So that's where the um, n minus 1 constraint, and if you, it comes from on L. And then if you pair that with the fact that m has to be between, um, well, between or equal to minus L and L, an integer uh, between those two values, then what you find, finally, is the two relations that you see in quantum mechanics all the time. So that's where it actually comes from. And if we look at these wave functions, everyone knows that m mod psi squared of this is the probability distribution. This gives the proper probability distribution, or at least the correct non-relativistic approximation. It also ignores spin, but it gives a, re a really good approximation to the correct uh, probability distribution for the um, <coughs> hydrogen atom electron orbitals. So those pictures in textbooks actually come from this or from solutions of the Dirac equation. But just for the pictures, it doesn't really matter. You may as well use the simpler thing. The, the corrections, the relativistic corrections and spin-dependent corrections are going to be not too visually noticeable. So that's where the orbitals come from. That's where the quantization comes from, from the boundary conditions. Uh, that is where that energy formula that we have right here for the hydrogen atom that you see often everywhere in chemistry, physics, right? That's where that comes from. And then also uh, these rules for the quantum numbers indexing orbitals also comes out of that problem. So it's a really crazy, rich with information problem to do. It's really fantastic. It's one of my favorites. It's probably the most famous problem in quantum mechanics. And that is how you solve it from start to finish. You get this beautiful hydrogen atom solution. And that's also why they say that uh, uh, Schrodinger, in a, in a sense anyway, discovered the shape of atoms, because he was the first person to postulate the Schrodinger equation and to solve it for the hydrogen atom, and this gorgeous, uh, experimentally uh, consistent result came out. Uh, Dietrich out.